this. And so, oh, <laughs> um, and uh, so for instance, so that voice is really funny. I maybe tell a funny story if I have time later on. Um, it's a very American voice. Um, so, um, so Pete Fisher and Dave Unwin said uh, back in 2005, they said geographic information theory articulates the idea of absolute Euclidean spaces quite well, but the socially produced and continuously changing notion of place has proved elusive, except perhaps, and I think that's really interesting if we think back to that train spotting example, that film, through photography and film. So that film um, actually immerses you in, in, in the Edinburgh of the 90s that I would recognize and remember as part of, part of my growing up, okay? Um, and it's interesting that back in 2005, when they talked about digital description, they didn't think of the idea of saying that, you know, um, a book could also be digital, text can also be digital, yeah? Um, and text obviously can capture very well the same things that photography and film can really capture. So, that kind of brings me to maybe you're saying, well, you know, this is all just a bit overblown. He's, he's making a big fuss about nothing. Um, I want to try and convince you, and I want to convince you not in a very complicated way. I want to show you um, a picture that's kind of typical of what we use when we're teaching GIS, when we, we, when we start using GIS with students, where we work with geographic information that are well-structured spatial data, where typically space is characterized using either crisp objects or continuous fields. And most importantly of all, the attributes that we have are single valued. So um, an object is, is either a building or a road, and that single value that is given represents a particular institutional viewpoint, perhaps a national mapping agency, perhaps a multinational technology company, and it reflects a particular purpose. And in a paper that we wrote, we said, where we were talking about this and in the context of place, we said, well, modern informations deal with places in an ad hoc and impoverished manner, basically as points of interest. So very often with no extent, so very often simply as point um, entities and with a strong bias towards commercial entities. And you're all sort of probably going, yeah, you know, now he's just really sort of one of these weird critical people that's just criticizing stuff. and doesn't really have anything um, um, constructive to say. I, I don't want to do that. I want later on in the talk to show how I think we can solve these problems, but I want to emphasize that I, if, I, if we go and look at, for instance, schema.org, which is used by many of these big technology companies as a sort of way of structuring data, then if we look at place, and they actually have, so places are a sort of thing, and if you go, you can then go down to other sorts of places, then you find out that places, the definition of place is an entity that has a somewhat fixed physical extension. And I only have to go down a little bit here to see that, you know, the sorts of things that are important for places are addresses, their aggregate rating, their amenity feature, their branch code. So in the example here, you know, for example, in the URL starbucks.co.uk store locator 3047, the code 3047 is a branch code for a particular branch, yeah? So very much biased towards these commercial entities, towards often point-based things that are points of interest and so on. And that's how modern information systems often think about places and place. So as VGI, so volunteer geographic information emerged as a field, as user-generated co content, emerged, people in GI science actually saw an opportunity, so a chance to address some of these issues. And in, in quite a few of the early papers about VGI, people started to talk about place. So um, Sui and Goodchild said in 2011 that formalizing place in the context of GIS will be interesting and challenging. Um, many people in the field used the terms place and space more or less as interchangeable, and that we didn't have an overarching theory of place um, or we, or, and we also didn't know really how to work with the concept. And then Sarah Elwood was a little bit more positive. So see, she said um, that VGI um, invited a more place-centric perspective and might stimulate the development of parallel placial geographic information systems. Yeah? So that kind of brings me um, to the first contribution that I think we can maybe make. And that first contribution 
is actually to say, well, what is it we're talking about when we talk about place? What, what would be a definition of place? And our definition um, took us quite a long time to get to. Um, it was work with Werner Kuhn and Stefan Winter, and Werner would call it an ontological um, commitment. And the definition was that a place is an object that results from a shared identification of a location. And here, both location and object are derived from Werner's core concepts of spatial information. Now, probably you're going, well, that's you know not very useful. How does that help us? Well, I want to show you how I think it helps a little bit, but it's maybe a little bit useful. Um, and so instead of you just saying, so what, I want to show you how we might use that to think about this volcano, the example I had back at the start. So locations in, in Vernal's core concepts are basically regions in space that can be defined through relations. So for example, volcano was actually at the end of Byers Road. So Byers Road is um, a street in Glasgow that runs down the hill near the university. And at the bottom of the bottom of the hill, you move from being one part of the town to another, you move to Partick, which is a little bit more gritty, and that's where a volcano was. So at the end of Byers Road is a way of defining a location. We don't need geometry to do that. Yeah. And then the geographic objects, those are unique entities. So volcano was obviously a particular place at a particular time. Um, that have locations, and they also have well-defined properties. So for instance, Volcano was a popular, I guess, student disco, because we were all students when we were going there in the early 90s. Um, and then the shared identification, and I think that's really interesting, that can happen in multiple ways. So Volcano was more than one place, actually. It was a, a place in train spotting where its location was moved to Edinburgh, and it was the place where a particular scene was played out with Renton and Diane. And then it was another place when I was a student in Glasgow. Yeah. Um, and the identification I would share with my student colleagues is a different one from all the people that watched the film. Um, and that just makes it two different places. And our, our definition can deal with that quite happily. Yeah. Because what's important now is that the definition allows us to describe places through, on the one hand, um, language, and on the other hand, geometry. And that, I think, is a, a really crucial thing that we need to be able to do. We need to move away in GI science and perhaps also in location-based services from thinking that geometry is the way that we have to do everything. Language is actually the way we communicate about place. It's the way we deal with place every day. And if we can build information systems that are more language-based, but that can differentiate between the idea of, for instance, locations and objects and objects having properties and their relations, then perhaps we can get much further. And then importantly, I want to convince you with one example that our definition is also compatible with theory from other fields, because I think that's also a really important issue. So there's been quite a lot of work in, um, in GI science on place, and almost all of it cites, for instance, Tuan. Um, and the seminal work that was done there. Um, but mostly what people do is they cite a few papers from human geography and then they carry on doing what we always did in GI science. So places are just named things. They're, they, they don't have any special properties. And I think that that's a mistake. I think if we're going to use human geography and we're going to use these things, we need to think about actually what they say. And I really like um, the work of Agnew. And Agnew defined um, three aspects of meaningful places, which also uh, fit in with a lot of other work that's been done in place by other people. So uh, he said that places have a location, the where. They have a locale, which um, he defined as the material setting for our social relations. So for instance, the um, rather untidy room that I'm in just now has a shape and a form, and that's the place where I live most of my life, and that is my locale, yeah, and it's irrelevant that it's in Zurich, it's this, this office um, that is my locale. And then the sense of place, which many people have heard of, this idea of the subjective and emotional attachment to a place, yeah. Um, and it's very important to think, when we think about sense of place, that we can have a sense of place without ever having been somewhere, that's conveyed to us, for instance, through literature or films or colleagues or whatever. There are lots of different ways that we might build up this sense of place. And why do I think this fits with the definition I gave before? Well, 
the location of Agnew is actually very similar to our location, yeah? And then the locale and the sense of place are basically describing the object and its properties um, that I said that we needed. And then the, the, the third aspect in our definition was this idea that they were shared, that more than one person would use these. So I want to talk a little bit now about how we might work with place, how we might actually do something. If we have this definition, maybe we can gather some data and then maybe we can actually come up with some examples of actually working with this. So first of all, what are, what are the things that we need if we're going to work with place data? Well, based on the definition, those data should reflect shared notions. They should somehow describe objects and they should also be locatable in some way, okay? But I would strongly argue that being locatable doesn't mean they have to have coordinates. That's important, that they could also be locatable using language, using spatial relationships, using topology and so on. It's also important that we remember that they might also be contradictory. Um, that for instance, one person's memory of a volcano, the disco might be quite different to another person's, that they might be vague. Um, so in language, we have we deal with both spatial and semantic vagueness quite happily all the time, and that they change over time, yeah. So that there may be changes going on in these data. So I'm going to show now um, four different ways, and they're just really four examples about how we might go about collecting such data. So the very first and the most obvious way of collecting data like these are in the field by asking people, ethnographic methods. And um, this picture here shows Nicholas Burenhall, a colleague of mine who is a, a linguist. And this is him with one of his consultants who is a Jahai. The Jahai are a hunter-gatherer um, group in Malaysia. Um, and Nicholas has done lots of work with the Jahai looking at how they name objects in the landscape, looking at how language relates to the landscape and so on. So I think it's really important that when we're all so excited about technology and so on, that we remember the possibility of going out and eliciting data in the field is an important and really interesting one. The second one is probably more familiar um, to most of us using user-generated content. And when I put this example together the other day, I was really excited. So. Uh, for the people who don't know Glasgow, Glasgow has an underground railway. And the underground railway um, is, uh, you can see, is orange. Um, and people call it the clockwork orange or the subway. And when I went in Flickr and looked for georeferenced images of, uh, of the clockwork orange, I got this beautiful circle, which basically maps exactly the route of the clockwork orange using some user-generated content. And if we go and look, we can find words, so language about how people actually describe this thing. But we've also got the locations of those things explicitly. We've got some relations, yeah? So um, quite useful data. I would like to differentiate between this sort of passively generated content and more um, actively generated content in the sense of what people call VGI. This is a picture from a project in the UK um, called Geograph. And the idea behind Geograph is to map um, all of the one kilometer grid squares uh, and for every one kilometer grid square to take pictures and write descriptions. And in fact, there are more than 6 million of these pictures that people have, have created um, with these descriptions. And this one again is in Glasgow, this is the River Kelvin. Um, so Lord Kelvin of the Kelvin temperature scale um, um, took his name from the place rather than the other way around. And um, this is describing a peaceful place where if you're at a busy conference, like perhaps you feel today and with this boring keynote, um, this would be a good place to go and recharge your batteries. So unfortunately, I can only offer you a virtual place to go and um, recharge your batteries. But what's important is we can find in these sorts of data places where people talk about doing those sorts of things. And then the last example, and actually something we work with a lot as data are unstructured text. So here, um, the description that goes with the picture of volcano that I showed at the start. So volcano was a club, I said, where Renton met Diane. Um, it was a club in Glasgow at Partick Cross. It used to be called Cinders, but actually it was also called Volcano and it played music, Blondie Heaven 17. I remember other music from Blondie and Heaven 17, but anyway, but nowadays it's gone. It's a big block of luxury flats. Um, and all traces of the 90s club scene have been erased from the area. So those are four 
different data sources that we might think about using. And I want to kind of gradually move towards wrapping up now by showing you how we can use those sorts of language data to study place. So I'm going to actually show an example um, using the elicitation. I'm going to show an example using user-generated content in the form of Flickr. And I'm going to show an example using um, geograph, using those volunteer geographic information. So the first example, I think, is super interesting. Um, so the Jahai, um, the way that they name places is actually based on the origin story of the Earth that they, um, that they believe. And their origin story basically says that lying on the ground along water courses are giants. And all of the giants have names. These giants are called Knell in Jahai. Um, and um, if you have a catchment, then the children of the giant are the streams that flow into um, the main stream and so on. So what you can actually do, so Nicholas has, so these, these points here, I hope you can see my cursor, but these points here are the names um, that are given by the Jahai. Um, and if you ask the Jahai, they can also tell you the family tree. So here's Mindalom, who, who would be the great, great, or the great grandfather, for instance. I can't say any of these Jahai words, so I won't try, but the grandfather of, of this one. Um, and what we did is, together with Nicholas, we looked at whether or not we could use basically catchment areas um, and Strahler ordinance, so uh, sort of um, methods from hydrology, to build the structure of this. And if that reflected the family tree, and what we found is that it did. And that's very interesting because what the Jahai are actually doing, so they live in the rainforest, what they, they're actually doing is they're building a cognitively very efficient system to name the world that's based on knowing the relations between these different giants and the family tree. Um, and that's how they partition up their world. Yeah, so their places are, are literally... They, 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 they're literally walking on the backs of these giants that are lying on the ground and they know their names. The second example using um, Flickr data is a little bit different. In the second example, what we actually did is we took um, streets in London and we treat those streets as being both locations and places at the same time. So we say, okay, that the location of a street is also a sort of meaningful place but then we give them properties and the properties we give them are based around the words that people use to describe them, around the people that took pictures there and also different times. And here I just show two examples of these because what we can do, so here we have Tower Bridge for instance. So what we can do is we can describe the similarity of one street, the relation of one street to other streets using these different dimensions. So the top diagram here shows similarity as a function of semantics, the words used to describe all these different streets. And the bottom one, according to which users photograph these different streets. And you can see the relationships are a little bit different. Um, and what this lets us do is start to explore the relations between places in different dimensions. The last example is kind of my favorite. Um, because the last example is all about tranquility. It's about finding peaceful places, places where um, we can perhaps go to have a rest, where we can go and recharge our batteries, places that during coronavirus have been very important. And in GIS, quite a lot of people are interested in tranquility or um, getting away from noise and so on. And what they typically do is they map potential tranquility. And the way that they do that is they map things in the landscape, roads and railways that detract from tranquility and other things that add to it. So seeing water, um, hearing birds and so on. And what they really produce are maps of potential tranquility. What we have here is, that, is though a map of experienced tranquility. These are thousands of places where people wrote about it being peaceful or tranquil and so on. And so we can see this map and then here on the, on the histogram, we actually see two things. We see the different classes of land cover and how much of them there are. So for instance, the most land cover in the UK is something called improved grassland. And you can see urban and suburban, there's not so much of. And then the colored bars are how much tranquility is in those places. And you can see there's much more tranquility in these urban areas. And if we go and look at the words that people use to describe that tranquility, we can see 
that they often talk about things like oasis or backwater or a, a tranquil place or a tranquil spot and so on. So we can start to find out the ways that people describe this tranquility. And as I said, what's important about this is this is, these are places where people experience tranquility. This isn't modeled tranquility, this is reported tranquility. Um, you'll be pleased, I'm sure, to hear I'm pretty much at the end. I want to make one kind of note of caution. So it's important when we do this sort of work to think about how we can apply the work, what we actually want to do with it. Um, and for the tranquility example and for the Jahai example, that's, that's very clear, I think, that we have questions that are societally relevant and so on that we can work on. For the one in the middle about the streets of London, that's a kind of typical GI science type thing that we do where we, we want to look at similarity and we want to describe place, but I'm not entirely sure what the application really is. And we should be careful about that. I think we should be self-critical in, in, in GIS and also in LBS about that. So that this, this rather nice quote, which is about, the, about um, spatial humanities, that the po poetics and the effect of power, her visualizations are maybe more powerful than the supposed result. But I think we learn some stuff as well. Um, so place matters. I think if we care about diversity, then place is absolutely essential. I also think that conceptualizing and modeling place isn't really nearly as hard as sometimes people make out. We don't need a big complicated theory about place. Rather, we need to think about these basic ideas. And our argument would be that, um, as I said, our definition is rather simple, that locatable objects that are shared, that's good enough. Important then is that the data considers this idea about shared notions and we need to capture more information about who's sharing, for instance. If we want to um, analyze place data, we can actually work quite well with existing data structures. I would argue we just need to use them more imaginatively and creatively. And last of all, and if you take away nothing else from this talk except this, language is key to place. Language is absolutely central to models of place. And we have to also remember that the, even the very notion of place might not actually translate to all cultures. I said I'd finish with a picture. Um, so this is uh, where I was at the weekend. It's a bit different to a uh, volcano. Um, maybe somebody knows where that is. We'll see. Um, and I'd be very happy to answer your questions now. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot for the very, very interesting talk. And, and my take on message actually is different from yours. That for me, I believe that actually we talk about location-based services, but at the end, it's probably for me, it's place-based services because it's important to introduce to go beyond kind of abstract locations or geometry to more humanity uh, information because it, at the end, the users are humans anyway. So we need to basically go to place-based uh, services. Okay, so that's for the audience. If you have any questions, you can type this into uh, to the Q and A. And I see that there's also a question from Baron. Do you want to ask the question yourselves or should I ask the question for you? So Loss, you can also see the question there. Yeah, I'm sure. So, so Baron's question is, would deaf and dumb people have no sense of place? And that's a really good question. Um, um, so, um, oh, Baron, I think you're being turned on. I'm not quite sure what's happening. Well, when, you, when you go to the, the answers one, you can also see this. Yeah. Uh -huh. So should I just keep talking? You have to tell me what I have to do now. I'm confused. Or is it simply answer the questions because okay. So uh, yeah. So so the answer is yes. Of course they would. Um, but um, first of all, I don't really know how their sense of of place would work. But it would work through different. I would assume it would work through different senses. So in some of our work, actually, what we've done is, and I didn't talk about that at all today. We've looked at characterizing landscape using, for instance, um, what what people hear. Yeah, and I can imagine that for deaf and dumb people, uh, what you smell and what you feel might be more important. Yeah, and maybe to emphasize that, I think that's also a really um, interesting question from another aspect, because from, from the per perspective of being European, we think of visual as always being the most important thing. Yeah, but some of the people I work with, so in fact, Nicholas um, and the Jahai, it's not necessarily the case that vision is always the most important sense in characterizing um, 
the world around you. I don't want to say place because I don't want to transfer place as a concept to everybody else. So um, the answer is absolutely deaf and dumb people would have a sense of place. And I think it's important that if we build systems, we think about ways where we might deal with that. And that's the whole point of trying to include diversity. I hope that kind of answers the question. And uh, now probably we go to Gail. So Gail, you, you can just unmute yourselves. Yeah, thanks Ross. That was uh, a really excellent and, and uh, yeah, thought, thought exposing uh, discussion. My question would be about your definition because I, I, when I understand you correctly, you really, you really try to promote the idea that we should not be fixed on geometry only, so to say, to, but to rather have a more holistic concept. Yeah. Understanding uh, space at the end of the day. Now, when you say place is an object, then immediately the connotation of a crisp object comes across. Yeah. Now, uh, that's the word I stumbled across. I mean, I like the definition, but the, the, the term object has that connotation immediately. Can't you replace object <laughs> with uh, a different term, so to say? So maybe the answer is yes and no. So in the paper, we actually talk about that. And so objects don't need to be bounded. Objects can be vague. But in order for them to be shared, they need to be identifiable. Yeah. So um, for instance, this mountain, uh, which um, is the Eiger, there's the Mitteleggy Ridge up the Eiger, um, we don't need to agree on where the mountain starts and stops to agree that, you know, it's one of the most imposing, spectacular mountains in the Alps. I think most people, many people would agree upon that, yeah? So the boundaries are not so important, but we do need to agree that we're talking about the same object. And that's what we mean when we when we, we say object. So we're, we don't mean things with crisp borders. We mean... Yeah, yeah. I, I get the argument, but, but still, I think there's this threat of getting into this what you try to avoid that we are thinking about geometry then and coordinates at the end so i i liked actually the term entity when you explained what you mean in your definition uh so could that be a replacement um yeah i guess i mean so so uh, i so i don't think werner's in the chat but um <laughs> i mean in the core concepts yeah, no, I know, but, but the, 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 the definition of, of object would, would be would, is deliberately such that the objects don't have to be bounded. And I think um, I think that's I mean, that's that it's a it's a bit the same as what Cresswell said about the start about place at the start. We all have an idea of what we mean when we say object. And then if we you know, so um, we have to actually think about, so in our day, in, in, in the paper, we're quite careful to explain that. And then I'm sure we could change the word, but I don't think the word actually matters. The word is just a symbol in terms of- Well, it's, it would be a question how powerful the definition might be considered then. Huh? But but yeah, I, I, I guess it's a matter of discussion. But the other thing I'm, I'm, I really liked was that you pointed out that the way we understand places might be really depending on and you mentioned, for instance, time, and I fully agree with this, but uh, what I missed was also you explicitly mentioned, uh, explicitly mentioning that it might be that it's depending also on particular groups. You said, well, it's depending on the language, and that could be one common denominator, but it can sure. be that even with the same language, there are different groups that have a different sense of place. Sure, absolutely. So, for instance, in the, in the Streets of London example, for instance, we looked at the difference, the usual thing people do, looked at the difference between uh, locals and tourists. Any way that you can stratify, um, I mean, so that that's kind of important. If it's not shared at all, then we think it's not really place, yeah? But as soon as it's shared, um, and I would try and, so the, 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 the question before about people who are deaf and dumb, I think that's really important because that's exactly the whole point. So that's why I said, in the conclusions, we need to think about who the people are who we're analyzing because the the, the place we extract is their place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, Ross. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Pleasure. Now let's go to Mina. So Mina, just unmute yourselves and then you can ask questions. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for your nice uh, presentation. I, I have two questions. 
Uh, first of all, I want to know, uh, you talked about the role of relations in defining places. Mm -hmm. How we can, how can we extract these relations from place descriptions? I know about the um, knowledge graph or uh, place graph, but uh, I'm looking uh, for new approaches or um, uh, uh, which method do you suggest for extracting uh, relations? Yep. Um, so that's an interesting question that I think is is very important. So. Um, one way is, for instance, if we characterize places by looking at their similarity and in which dimensions are similar. So, for instance, those tranquil spots that I showed you, um, we can look at the semantics of those tranquil, tranquil places and then look at which ones have similar semantics. So are they, are they can, what, what are the things that make them tranquil? Yeah, so those, that would be an example of relations between places. So I think it's really important that we don't think about relations as only being spatial or geometric, but also semantic, or also, and maybe that, so that comes back to the question before, in the sense of the people who are describing the places, yeah, so the, the groups, for instance. Um, so all of those things would be ways that we could think about that. One thing that's maybe also, so that I'm kind of intrigued by, and I've been intrigued by for a while, um, is, thinking about the places that don't get talked about and um, the places that are that we don't find that are not mentioned and actually that's another reason why that film train spotting is kind of interesting because train spotting was all about the edinburgh that you don't usually find in, in or don't, don't so often find in books it was about this sort of part of edinburgh that the tourists don't go to and doesn't get written about so much and that's a really interesting thing to look at, you know, these contrasts. But that, that would be how I would look at relations between places. Uh, thanks. Uh, Anna? Thank you very much, Ross. That was really interesting. Uh, talk. Um, my question, well, I've got two, actually, if that's OK. The first one is about virtual places, how you describe them, because they're not fixed in a location, I believe, but they're they have some sort of sense of a space. And I, I just don't know. I, I want to hear your opinion. And the second bit is, I understand that's how we define it, but it is extremely biased to the perception of the place. And one of the best thing about data is the raw and those sort of level of innocence that aren't contaminated by human bias. So you can actually act on that. So if, for example, a place is not this let's say women friendly you can quantify that or at least describe that and act on that but if it is being just recognized by that characteristic i'm not sure if we can actually help to improve the perception in some sense because that's a part of the definition can you comment on that too okay so the the first one the first one is easier than the second one so um Virtual places are just places, as far as I'm concerned. I don't think it matters. I mean, uh, in in train spotting, volcano in the film isn't real. It doesn't exist. It's in the wrong place, and everything. It doesn't matter. They they create a sense of place. They immerse you in it. Um, you believe in it. You share it. You think it's in Edinburgh. No problem. Um, the second part of the question about perception. So I guess that's kind of fundamental. Um, it comes, so you said data were unpolluted, but I don't actually believe that. So I would always argue that, you know, we make decisions about which data we collect and those decisions about which data we collect are institutionalized and politicized and so on as well. And so um, whether or not so what we are very interested in doing in our group is, is looking at what people actually describe. Because what we find is that if we use sort of traditional spatial data, they capture some aspects of what people like, but not other aspects. And this that, that tranquility example is really the best, best one to explain that. Because as I said, in these traditional maps of tranquility, they map vast. So if I go maybe back, um, to this map, you know, everything up here is tranquil according to these maps. 
but it isn't because nobody goes there and experiences the tranquility. The tranquility down here in London is way more important. And if we can identify the places that people actually experience as being tranquil, that really matters. And what we found when we did that is we found that those places were um, very commonly described through contrast. So it was a peaceful place despite, even though, yeah? And I think that's really important because then we can actually protect places like that. And if you were to do it using data and use some value, some decibels or whatever, you would say, well, none of these places are peaceful anyway. It doesn't really matter what we do. But it turns out it does because people appreciate them and use them. So I guess that would be my answer. I know it's not completely satisfactory, but that's how I would answer that question. Okay, can I ask a, a very short follow up? I, I appreciate that data um, element is, is always biased who collected, what collected, but at least we, we are aware of the bias because it's not inherent in the definition. I, I'm a little cautious about that because, for example, if I measure temperature, I know that the temperature is not going to be biased. The fact that I collect that temperature, maybe, but if you define place based on the perception, I think that's going to remain biased forever. But play, well, I guess my really simple answer would be place is all about perception. You can't, so, you know, if, if we measure the temperature, so actually let's go back to my picture at the end. Um, it was really, really, really cold there, probably for most of you. And I thought it was fine. And my friend had his shorts on. Um, so measuring the physical temperature doesn't actually tell us what different individual people would perceive and value about that place. And I, so I think we have to be quite careful about so I totally agree that you, we can measure things, but transferring those measurements and temperature is a great example um, to how we actually feel about a place is quite difficult. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I see Oscar. Let me ask you to. Yeah. So Oscar, now you can talk. Hi, Ross. That was really interesting. I kind of have a maybe weird question because uh, well, link to my keynote. I don't know if you were there uh, when I was talking. I was teaching, unfortunately. Teaching. Well, it's all about animal movement, right? Yeah. And you're talking about perception of space. And mm -hmm. um, how can, I mean, we don't know what animals think because we cannot ask them. But we do know, for example, that migratory animals return to the same location to uh, winter for the same location to build a nest in the uh, in the summer um, that for example you have bats foraging on the same tree even if there are like 20 other trees around so maybe they have a some kind of perception of place i don't know so what, what's your thought on this so can this kind of thing be applied in in animal movement and and can it be, you know, extended beyond humans? It's a crazy question, I know, sorry. No, 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 it's not such a crazy question, but I think sometimes it's good to say, I don't know, and I don't know. Um, I think... Like I think in ecology, you have, for example, this theory about central place foraging, right? Which yeah. is a methodological approach, which is that uh, you need to account that the animal always goes to a central place. So, for example, if you have a bird sitting on the nest and then go and forage or feed or whatever, it always has to return to the, to the nest because it has to sit on the eggs, right? So when you're modeling the, the movement across space, you have to have this null model that is going to prefer the nest and the surroundings of the nest versus the rest because it's always returning there, right? So this is kind of a methodological equivalent of relation analysis maybe, I don't know. I'm just throwing this so, out because I, I thought it was really interesting that maybe with this kind of a connection. So I think that the interesting question would be in this context, how do animals communicate about this? Because the stuff that we're doing is all about language. Um, and I mean, so if I look at, outside my office, so how Sheng knows that there are some meerkats that hang out and I know that the meerkat researchers um, look at how they communicate. Um, and I'm certainly not going to make the claim that the meerkats don't communicate about places in ways that are not dissimilar from humans. But I think that would be, I guess that would be, at least from, from the per perspective I'm coming from, we need to understand more about how the animals are communicating about it. And then it might be indeed quite an interesting way of looking at things. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks anyway. So, yeah.
like I said, crazy question. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Uzka. Uh, yeah, I see that there's also another hand. So let me try to allow it as well. Uh, Perry, do you want to ask as well? So basically, Perry's question is on the Q&A that does people's understanding of place, places created through language that is more than created visually, for example, by maps? So that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I have a map on the uh, wall of my office, which um, is a map of underground London. And it's... Uh, it's a very beautiful map. It's called London Subterranea by Stephen Walter. And basically it's a map of lots of stuff that's underground, but it's covered in writing. So it's absolutely covered in words. And that's the way that the author chooses to convey a sense of place about all these underground places in London. And I would argue that maps, so more traditional cartographic products I, I think for most people don't convey nearly as much information as language about a location. I would, I would say that they're a little bit different. Um, but that, but of course people do and, and they deliberately do that. They try to create maps that convey a sense of place, yeah? But very often when they do that, they add annotations to the map. They add lots of little sentences or explanations. That's this, that map I'm thinking about is covered in those. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. I lost, actually, I also have a question regarding your definitions. You emphasize a term called shared. And for me, I think this is basically very, very important for when you communicate with humans, human to human, this is very, very important. But very, very often, we communicate with machines. And there, do we need to be, to, 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 basically, do we need to be, have this, to, this shared by with others? Because my, my understanding is that basically for me, okay, oh, that's my home, and that's also a place, and that's probably, probably all my own interpretation only. So my question for you is that, is your place definition too narrow? Um, in, in what sense? Because your home's only your home. Yes, so what I mean is that, for example, in we think about the services, so basically you might try to model or what is this, this location mean for me and also for the users. And there, then the, basically the, the definition of place doesn't need to be shared with others. So well, you see, I get, I, I, so, okay, I, I, I think I get your point. But if I get your point correctly, at least needs to be shared between you and the machine you're communicating with, and then it's already shared. So, um, you know, a, 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 meaning, a, a meaningful place could be really, for me at least, it could be simply somewhere that I and one of my children go that's special for us, or it doesn't really matter who the sharing is with, but if there is no sharing, um, and in this context with, with between you and a machine, then it sort of all breaks down. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks a lot. I guess we don't have time for other further questions. Thanks a lot for Ross for the, for, for the interesting talk and also for the, for the Q&A. So with this, we come to the end of the day. I'm not sure about you. For me, I feel exhausted. We have a a very dense program, a lot of interesting talk, a lot of ideas and so on. For me, I need a break. I think probably many of you also the same. But, but remember tomorrow we have another days of interesting talk and also keynotes. And also basically, basically we have the best paper sections. So tomorrow we will start from 9 a.m. to GMK, basically GMT. So basically start to remember to log in again and I hope to see you tomorrow. And so have a nice evening and thanks a lot, Ross, and thanks a lot for all the presenters. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. It was really interesting talk, Ross. I really enjoyed it, especially seeing all the pictures of Glasgow. I think people at Glasgow are pleased to know that, you know, our former students is now a great scientist and using a lot of pictures of Glasgow in his talk. Yeah, well, I probably should have spent more time in lectures and less time in discos, but anyway. Um, <laughs> okay. Hopefully at Glasgow. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Ciao. Bye.